Hey, everybody. I'm Matt Stenpeck. For those of you I don't already know, I'm the curator of the Civic Tech Field Guide, which is loading here. Um, so basically, our mission since 2016 is to productively grow this field of civic tech that we work in. If you think of Enrique's metaphor with the house that's on fire of democracy, then it's really important that we do our work well. And that's the whole purpose of this project, is to share what's working, what hasn't worked, and also help us better connect with each other, whether that's partner organizations or open source code, just a whole bunch of resources that we've tracked to help every, all of us do better. Um, we're now up to over 8,500 hand-categorized projects and organizations here. Don't worry, there's lots of filters. So you can like filter for your country, you can filter if it's open source, and um, it spans participatory democracy and elections, but also GovTech, where the GovTech is about shifting power, journalism, where it's about engaging the audience, open government data, and also related fields like uh, ethical AI, that's you know quickly a lot of overlap with our field. Uh, but today I want to share the results of some pro bono democracy tech consultations we did last year. So basically National Endowment for Democracy funded this as part of a larger grant to support the Civic Tech Field Guide. And let's see, we put out an open call and a lot of people helped us share it. Uh, basically to do pro bono kind of one-on-one -on -one clinic consultations with different democracy activists around the world to see whether we and our database of resources might be able to help with their challenges. We got 32 applications, which allowed us to create a rubric where we were able to prioritize uh, global majority countries and also countries that are less free on uh, Freedom House's Global Freedom Score. So we ended up with um, a mix of countries, but participant organizations in places like Venezuela, Nepal, Colombia, Lebanon, Tanzania, Bangladesh, Malaysia, among others. The average Freedom House score uh, for these countries is a 54 out of 100. So both backsliding democracies and also people operating environments where you really can't call it a democracy to begin with. Um, and they also varied a lot in terms of what kind of organization they were. You know, we worked with the, the only remaining political satire publication in Bangladesh. And others were funders, and others were building tech, and others were scrappy NGOs. So it really surprised me when there were a lot of similar challenges coming up across these different organizations that are operating in completely different regions of the world, and different sectors and everything. Um, and the way it worked was I would do some pre-research with them uh, about their organizations, their work, and then we'd do a consultation call, and then I would go off and do some more research based off everything they shared on the call about what their challenges are. See, we'll get into the needs in a sec. Um, but just quickly results, it was really rewarding for me. I've spent a lot of time building these kind of abstract field-wide resources, and other than conferences like this or web analytics, I don't always know the direct impact it's had. And with these sessions, it was very one-on-one, -on -one, and I got to see the effect of sharing a resource and how it could unlock the organization's work. Um, and then the other surprising finding was just the overlap in the group's needs. And so, you know, 10 different countries, 10 different organizations, but I'm gonna give just five, uh, five quick of the common needs in the hopes that we as a field can start to think about how we can address these, not just for our, our individual organizations, but together and collectively, which I know some groups are doing. Um, you know, funding may be an obvious one, but specifically the groups talked about the stability of funding, multi-year grants, and also this challenge, which has come up multiple times today, of being able to get funding for the priorities and the strategy that you have, and not just what funders are currently interested in. So um, I am gonna try to do a little interaction because it's late in the day, but. Can you raise your hand if funding is a major issue for your organization? No? Cool, so for the live stream folks, that's I'd say over half the room, yeah? Okay, over half, cool. Um, and then I'm gonna share a resource for each of these that we can all use. Uh, and I also encourage you, if you wanna post in the Slido any resources you have on these, I would also like to see those. Um, but one funding resource is every week with the Civic Tech Field Guide, we, we basically subscribe to every Civic Tech newsletter we can find and we comb through them on a weekly basis, not every, but a lot, and uh, we extract relevant fundraising deadlines, and we put those in an open community calendar, so that goes in our weekly newsletter. If you go to civictech.guide, G-U-I-D-E, slash calendar, you can add the calendar to your calendar app, and even in grant opportunities that we are applying for ourselves are in there, so more competition, that's great, 
And yeah, this is one, um, one fundraising resource. And then the second one was digital security, cybersecurity. Um, this one feels like it's gone from a nice to have to a must have in recent years. And even groups, especially groups that are working for democracy in democracy challenged countries, let's say, but also even groups working on things like public health that used to be fairly innocuous are increasingly being targeted by spyware, DDoS attacks, online harassment based on gender, um, coordinated takedown campaigns of their social media pages, and uh, hacks of devices and threats to personnel and office spaces with physical security. Um, please raise your hand if cybersecurity is, or physical security is a, an issue for your org. Okay, so maybe 40%, 35% of the room. Um, that's good, it's a different universe, but uh, one resource I'll share here uh, is just on the Civic Tech Field Guide, we have a whole cybersecurity section. And basically I went to various digital rights conferences for the past couple of years and inventoried all of the free programs and resources that are available. So projects like Jigsaw's VPN, uh, DDoS prevention tools, Cloudflare, um, and also even the free kind of instant support if you're currently under attack, there's programs for that. So even if you're a small NGO, you don't know much about cybersecurity, there are a lot of free resources for us out there. The third was partnership and networking. And this one was specifically uh, having the time and space to learn from peers on what's working. This one jumped out at me because I've done a couple different projects in different domains, disinformation, uh, participation platforms around the world. And this one keeps coming up in different domains. Oop. Okay, this was freaking out. Um, but taking the time and the space to know what's working with peers um, and, and basically like stay up to the current state of the art, especially in technology. Uh, so raise your hand if, if peer learning is, a, is an, um, a priority or a concern. Okay, so say one third, we'll say, cool. Um, so that, this need actually led to my society's new communities of practice program where in a couple different domains like parliamentary monitoring organizations, we're now actually able to gather that community both virtually and in person to really get into the weeds of like the specifics of parliamentary monitoring around the world and, and what's working, what's not, challenges like legal action. Um, and there's another resource here, I'm kind of promoting the Civic Tech Field Guide because that's my project, but we've been adding organizations to the database over the past couple of years. This initially started as just tools and now we have contact forms so you can directly get in touch with groups. So take a look, filter by your country and see if you don't find interesting projects that might be a relevant partner for you. Um, some groups have used our resource to do just that and maybe it started with open source code forking and then they actually ended up organizational partners. So just some interesting ways that we can team up. The fourth one was public engagement. So this is our bread and butter with the field guide is how do we you know, help public officials and others engage the public better. And part of this is also just comes up again and again. Groups need more ways to track what's happening on social media. You know, Twitter used to be the most open and now a lot of those tools are broken and it was never that representative to begin with. Um, and then, you know, some groups are working to scrape TikTok, for example, but that's very difficult and not exactly promoted by TikTok. Um, so the ability to listen and know what your community is talking about before you launch a campaign is critical and we don't have many resources here. And another example, one of the organizations helps uh, elect women to local office in Sub-Saharan Africa and they've been very successful. They've elected a lot of women from their cohorts. Now they need to sort of shift and consider how to support these women as they govern locally and that's where this need to reach constituents uh, came up. So of course there's civic tech platforms that we all know and love and there's also which has come up today, you know, people are more on WhatsApp or other platforms, how do we engage there? And to what extent, some of the top ideas I had were, okay, sometimes there's even a feature for a public official to engage the community on a platform like Nextdoor, which is a neighborhood-based social networking app. A lot of these features only exist in Europe and the US. So it's another challenge. Another resource that came up that I actually learned about doing this research um, as a public participation engagement thing was the Matrix Protocol, which is an open protocol for managing lots of different messaging apps and chat apps with your community. And so several groups were all working on that separately. 
but you can imagine a, a common resource on the ability to reach all of your community across many messaging apps could really help us all out. And so lastly, oh no, second to last, second to last. Capacity building, this one is um, kind of a grab bag, but these groups and many of us are doing the same work of we need to learn how to engage the media, we need to fundraise well. Uh, basically everyone was looking for contacts at the big tech platforms uh, for when their content gets taken down or when they're facing harassment on social media. And during the same time frame that we were doing this program, a lot of those teams were getting cut at the tech companies. Uh, NDI actually has a cool program to connect civil society and product teams. But I think we need much more of this and um, more inroads because, you know, once it comes down to someone like me just looking on LinkedIn to try to help someone, it's not really a formal enough system. Another uh, just common need was many of these groups are building digital literacy all the time for their staff, for their communities. So communal resources for instilling digital literacy as things like AI just take off and become hard to keep up with, I think it is critical. So that's five. Um, just reflecting on the program, I think first of all, it was really well received by the participants, which exceeded my expectations for it. Um, they rated it a 4.86 out of five on an anonymous survey after the clinics with a median score of five out of five. Um, similar high scores about it being a valuable use of their time, about uh, the resources we identified could contribute to their core mission, and then that they would consult the Civic Tech Field Guide again in the future. Um, so basically, we created these research briefs for the teams, and they liked that they were realistic and directly related to their needs. Um, what was cool for me is we do this with a Civic Tech Field Guide on a weekly basis anyway. So uh, some of the, you know, just marshalling these resources on behalf of a specific org, it wasn't much more work to be able to be funded to have the time to do that. Um, and then it was a pretty small amount of funding relative to other things. Um, but then things like the Matrix Protocol, un uncovering that for teams could basically multiply the impact of their work. We came up with entire new technical infrastructures, um, that had multiplying effects. Reflecting critically on the program, it was always designed as sort of a one-off consultation, but many of the groups would have liked to have more ongoing consultation, which makes a lot of sense. So if I were to do this again, I think I would um, try to identify funding ahead of time to not just recommend uh, resources and changes, but also have funding to help implement the changes. Because if you think about it, if staff capacity is an issue, then getting a brief full of things you can do is not super helpful. But just thinking about the field in general, um, I wanted to think, and maybe we can do this in discussion too, uh, but it highlighted for me as a field, we could do a much better job both systematically identifying what many common needs are around the world for our groups, and then of course, collectively addressing those. Um, a lot of funding goes to individual efforts, which is appropriate, but a lot of impact could also come from collective resources. And I, I saw one cool example of this in Southeast Asia where a couple different groups teamed up and they took an open source grant making app that was open source but not very good, <laughs> and they invested their resources together to make it better. Um, and we've seen the same with uh, Decedum and Consul where different cities around the world contribute to the development of these platforms to reach an economy of scale that no one city could do. So I think we could better formally support this kind of uh, need identification and need, collective need solving. So if you are a funder or you have one in your life and you'd be interested in this kind of thing, please reach out. Um, I just wanna thank these organizations for entrusting me to get involved with their work, which is very precarious work, and um, also taking the time to meet with me. Thanks. <laughs>